One sec, yeah. So we are live. Thanks a lot for being with us today. I want to uh, thank all of the speakers in the first place. It's, uh, I thank Arthur for the analytical paper he prepared for us. So my name is Viktor Kowalski. I'm going to be your moderator today. Yeah, so uh, like US-Ukraine uh, relations, especially with the US foreign policy towards Ukraine is a highly disputed issue right now in Ukraine, given the Biden-Putin summit, given the NAFTA gas changes in NAFTA gas leadership. So in Ukraine, they are perceived as actually one of the reasons related to the lack or to the rise of the Western support in Ukraine and like US remains one of the key partner states for Ukraine like in a security dimension, political, economic one. So it's uh, like one should never underestimate the influence as the status of our bilateral ties and its impact on the political, economical development of both of our countries. So now we're here to discuss both issues as well as solutions to some problems we have or may have uh, in many dimensions, including security, energy, public diplomacy, or economic ties with US and Ukraine. And so the key question to formulate would be, what should Ukraine do to win the support of the United States of America? And how US also should adapt its policy, maybe in some particular dimensions or globally, to receive much of outcomes uh, when it comes to Ukrainian or American foreign policy. Yeah, so I will introduce our speakers. So the Arthur Koldomasov is uh, our fellow, senior fellow of Industrial Think Tanks, the author of the like analytical paper with regard to which we started our discussion. We also have Scott Karanin, the head of US Europe Alliance with us. We have Dr. Mikhail Minakov, senior advisor on Ukraine as the Canon Institute with us today. And we have like Dr. Anna Ohanyan, non-resident senior scholar at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace today with us. Yeah. So thanks a lot for finding the time in the schedule to join our meeting, uh, like to speak about such timely matters related to US Ukraine relations. Yeah. So my first question is the moderator which I would like to address to all of our speakers would be to uh, see what obstacles or issues do you see right now as it hinder uh, the development of US-Ukraine relations. So you may speak as generally of the relations or you may speak about a concrete sphere, for example, security dimension or uh, energy dimension and so on. So what are the obstacles to identify and then we'll be speaking about the ways uh, or like no, if there are no ways about the, maybe some ideas how to overcome it. Yeah. So my first question is about like what bothers the relations now and which are some key triggers that hinder some proper strategic partnership uh, if this exists. Yes, yeah. so I will start with Arthur then. Arthur, please, what do you think about this? Well, first of all, uh, greetings to everybody who joined us uh, here today. It's very nice to see you being interested in that topic. The second thing I'd like to point out at the introduction to our conversation is that I'm really grateful to all the people who sent their feedback to the paper that we've prepared because it was really important for us and uh, especially important in the limelight of the recent uh, summit in Geneva, uh, in my opinion, but we'll talk uh, about the paper itself later. If uh, we want to focus on the current issues uh, of the Ukrainian-American relations uh, and the way to solve uh, these issues, I would like to point the most significant one that is an obstacle to solve other little issues. In my opinion, it's the lack of the concept in these relations, the lack of the uh, mutual understanding of the interests of both parties in these relations. And with that paper, we really wanted to bring that concept 
to these relations. With these four levels of cooperation and with different methods, we really tried to bring some kind of a concept into these relations and to recommend some kind of a framework to work in these relations because uh, sometimes we feel like we get lost in uh, some understanding between the Ukrainian and American governments. And sometimes the Ukrainian government demands too much from the United States and thinks that the United States have to like give uh, everything what they uh, can or what they are able to to give only to Ukraine uh, because, and I will finish the sentence on purpose because that's really the mindset behind that um, statement like this. And also uh, sometimes it feels like the American government does not have people who are directly interrelated with the current Ukrainian issues. And of course, uh, sometimes all of that can remind us a game of the broken phone when some kind of uh, moderators or mediators are trying to broadcast the issues and their solutions, but sometimes they are getting outdated very quick or they are not relevant uh, on that level that uh, are that other issues are. And I think that the proper concept will really help to establish that mutual understanding and that connection that can solve some other issues because we can talk about a lot of things uh, today and i think that other speakers will fill the void in that context uh but in my opinion uh the again the existence of the correct concept will help us to move away in my opinion from that mindset of taking everything for granted without any like outcomes or visible results and uh, my finishing remark uh in that speech uh will be uh, will sound in the following way i think that the ukrainian government really has to understand that everything depends directly on the actions of the ukrainian government and there can be so many states and so many entities who can tell what to do and what not to do but everything depends on the decisions of the directly Ukrainian government only. And they have to understand that responsibility and they have to understand that role, I think. Um, so yeah, I think that other speakers will uh, add some interesting thoughts to that. Uh, thanks a lot, Atom, for your point of view. So now we'll like move uh, to the next speaker. So Mr. Spot, please. So the Atom was had some of like Ukraine's and perspective as Ukrainian. Yeah, so like hearing uh, always to Ukrainian agenda. So as like you as uh, US representative here on, uh, on our panel. Yeah, so how do you assess it? Maybe you have some other thoughts related to the point like of your residency, how do you see the uh, situation from the Americans? What do they think of Ukraine, which are uh, key priorities? So maybe what they don't understand about Ukraine, but they should. And, and so how does it, the situation look to you like? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. And it's really uh, an honor for me to be, to share the Zoom screen with, with several other very distinguished um, you know, experts on this field. Um, you know, looking at my, my co-panelists here who, uh, who know Ukraine so much better than I do, uh, I thought uh, being a longtime resident of Washington, D.C., and someone who's worked in Washington, D.C. for a number of years, I would try and share my perspective about how things 
look in Washington and how recent developments in Washington uh, affect the way um, Ukraine is viewed. And the you know, and of course we have a very good timing on this. Um, we're, we're speaking just a few days after um, President Biden traveled to the UK for the G7, um, to Brussels for the NATO summit, uh, and then to uh, Switzerland for the uh, Putin Biden summit. Um, you know, and I think it's really telling that uh, President Biden's first overseas trip was to Europe, and I, I think that's definitely a, a clear signal to all of us about where. Um, about what part of the world um, he thinks is important and where his administration will put will put some focus. Um, but I think to begin my, you know, to think about how I frame this, um, I think about how much Washington has changed in the last few years. Um, and, and I mean, not just in terms of foreign policy um, towards, towards Europe, but I think the thing that, that really stands out to me um, is how much Washington DC has changed and how it thinks about China. And things that are now mainstream views um, were things that five, seven, eight years ago um, were, would be considered extreme um, and, not, and certainly not mainstream views. Um, and so we look at, within, even within Europe, the EU has come to label China um, a systemic rival um, both the G7 communique and the NATO communique from last week um, really um, call out China, the challenge of China, um, both for its non-market policies, um, but also for um, the challenges it poses for Europe and cyber, for NATO and space, especially the, the document pointed out. Um, and, and even you know, here in the US um, where I am, um, not only elite opinion has changed, but public opinion has changed. Um, before President Trump, um, about something on the order of four out of 10 or five out of 10 Americans would have called um, China um, uh, a rival or a threat or an enemy. And now that number is nine in 10. Uh, there's been a dramatic shift both in elite opinion um, within Washington, D.C., but in the broader public opinion. And so, and so I think this is really going to be um, a, an enduring framework for the way in which the US um, sees the world. And, and to connect this to Ukraine and to Europe, I, I think we're at a point now where the US is asking Europe, which includes, which includes Ukraine, is Europe, uh, how are you relevant in the great contest of the 21st century, which is uh, this, this competition with China? Where, where does Europe fit in? Where does the transatlantic relationship fit in to this, to this broader um, contest? Um, that we now find ourselves in. Um, and you know, and that's really a continuation between Trump and Biden. And it's probably the biggest point where, where Biden is sticking with um, at least the, uh, the substance, if not the tone uh, of Trump's policies towards, towards China. Um, one big thing that's been a difference um, which I think is the other big topic uh, next to China and that is um, corruption and the future of democracy um, and, and this the systematic competition between authoritarianism and, and, and democracy. Um, just a few weeks ago, President Biden released a national security study memorandum, basically a document from the National Security Council from the White House labeling corruption a core US national security issue. Um, and, and you know and that, that's that's a pretty big statement. Um, and you know, and and I think you know, I think about Biden, even even in Ukraine, and his very last trip um, uh, to Ukraine, his last foreign policy trip in 2017 as vice president, um, he spoke before the Ukrainian parliament and several times repeated the importance of anti-corruption. Um, and so, and so, looking at these two trends in U.S. foreign policy, one being uh, a more uh, firm stance opposing Chinese aggression and a more firm stance um, supporting democracy and opposing corruption and kleptocracy. Um, these are the frameworks through which US foreign policy is being viewed and which is being shaped. And I think the challenge for Ukraine and the challenge for those of us on this on this conversation on the on this Zoom call is that um, uh, Russia and Europe are, are part of these trends, but 
it's about more than just that. And, and without weakening one iota on Crimea or Russian aggression in the East, um, but that in itself is not, um, you know, is not, is not sufficient. And I think, you know, the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian leaders have to find a way to answer this question of how are they, how are they making progress? How are they relevant? How are they contributing to the solution and not being part of the problem within these two big categories um, of U.S. foreign policy? Um, and 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 I'll, I'll and I'll, I'll end just I'll wrap my comments up. You know, thinking about it in terms of you know, Ukraine has to be relevant as part of these conversations. Um, but also, you know, I think it's Ukraine will have to be very careful going forward about not pulling the US into Ukrainian domestic politics, which unfortunately has been a problem for many, many, many years. Um, and has maybe helped in a short time, one particular politician or one political party, but is incredibly detrimental to the correct understanding um, of what is happening in Ukraine, in Washington, DC, and in the US. Um, and second, I think uh, there is a real time limit um, on, on, on Ukraine needing to do this. Um, and we can probably talk about Nord Stream 2 and, and the, the short timeline on that. But also, um, I'm thinking in the American political context, um, the US will have midterm elections um, in just about 18 months in the fall of next year, 2022. And there is a, a very, very high chance that the Republican Party will, will, will recapture the majority in the House of Representatives in the lower House of Congress. And there is still a lot of, of unresolved um, confusion um, about, uh, about how Ukraine was involved in, in the impeachment of Trump and, and what are clearly false and, and conspiratorial allegations about Ukraine and Hunter Biden. But um, uh, unfortunately, the result of that has been that Ukraine has increasingly become a partisan issue and, 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 is, and is not enjoying the bipartisan consensus it, it, it benefited from for many, many years, um, including during Euromaidan and during um, the 2014-2015 period. Um, and so there, there's a, a real danger that we get to um, the end of next year, um, a, a Republican Party recaptures the majority in Congress, um, and and folks uh, and members of Congress with um, uh, with very incorrect and conspiratorial understandings uh, about Ukraine and about U.S.-Russian relations um, will not just be a fringe min min minority. Um, but might really be in a place to influence foreign policy. So that, and that's both a challenge for the US as well as for Ukraine. And I mentioned it here as an example that many of these problems have been longstanding, um, but I think we're coming to a point where um, they, they cannot be left unaddressed and they cannot be allowed to fester as they have been. Um, and so I leave that as one, you know, one final warning, both, both um, to Americans and Ukrainians um, that, uh, as always, um, reform is needed and reform is needed um, is needed faster. And with that, I'll pause. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Scott, for your view on like uh, Ukraine-US relations, relations on the point of view of Washington. And now we are going like to, to hear uh, Mr. Minakov, so to have some a third opinion. So the artwork is like a Ukraine based analysts. They're working for Ukrainian think tank. You are American analysts working for American institutions. And uh, Mr. Menakov is Ukrainian analyst, but uh, interacting with the Western institutions, with the Canon Institute, as I mentioned before. So uh, we will have like the side point of view, and then we'll have Madam Anna speaking with us here. So please. Thank you, Victor. Uh, well, it Canon Institute is working for almost 30 years to advance the dialogue between Ukraine, Ukrainian communities of scholars, experts, and policymakers with their uh, American peers. So in a way, we have this institutional memory and experience for 30 years, and we definitely saw ups and downs in this process. 
And I must admit that our, from our po point of view, from our experience, we know that actually today this uh, dialogue is very vibrant and rich, but still very disbalanced. So when we look at uh, topic wise, it's very much rich uh, in terms of communication, the, the track on security. And here, military staff, security staff, and politicians working on that specific issue, they are uh, in permanent contact and permanent communication. However, other tracks like civil society uh, dialogue, opposition's dialogue, um, intellectuals, it, it has very unstable situation. Of course, the, the COVID year was influencing it a lot. And again, uh, in th these different uh, tracks that we have today in the dialogue, there's one definitely experiencing a need to review. It's the political leadership dialogue. Recently, like in the recent at least four weeks, we had series of expressions from President Zelensky, from uh, members of his administration, with very harsh criticism towards United States, towards France, Germany, and collective West as a such. And uh, I was really feeling uncomfortable that we have this uh, strong uh, and permanent, non-ending, unceasing um, criticism, which sometimes is fair, let's face it, but sometimes is very unfair. And it was really showing rather Kyiv's, official Kyiv's uh, inability to understand what is the strategic framework within which the United States and the, the West are moving ahead. So I was uh, uh, making a questionnaire that will be published by end of today in our uh, Canon Ukraine uh, focus, uh, the, the Canon Institute's blog on Ukraine, where uh, informed experts with very good sources in uh, White House in uh, Champs Elysees, near the Palace uh, of Elysee, and in uh, Chancellor's office, they, they basically answer if Berlin, if Paris, and DC were actually disturbed by the the rhetorics of Kyiv. And it looks like no, uh, the the Western uh, decision to support Ukraine cannot be shaken even by um, exaggerated criticism from Ukrainian side, uh, which is good. It means that the, the, the West understands the unity of the destinies, the, the fate that brings us together. So we basically uh, are together and looking at, at the future together. However, there's the, the signal from Kyiv shows that in, uh, Kyiv needs to understand what's going on, why there's a intensified dialogue with Moscow where Ukraine does fit. And here I actually agree with Scott that probably this shift and this policy orientation and policy, grand policy, grand strategy uh, um, orientation is not entirely understood in Kyiv. This is why the, the dialogue of current leadership should be intensified. It's great that uh, we will have soon a meeting of the presidents, but it's definitely uh, an, a, a great need to reestablish normal communication in terms of having uh, ambassadors on the both sides. We have new ambassador uh, of Ukraine in Kyiv, very vibrant and energetic woman. And uh, uh, we need a normal plen plenipotential ambassador in Kyiv who is missing for very long time. So in a way, uh, this shows that in spite of the bipartisan support to Ukraine and uh, the, the common understanding of the united future uh, between the West and Ukraine, there are issues of tactical, I hope tactical um, nature that needs to be addressed. And here, uh, it should be addressed by leadership meetings at the summits, but also this permanent normal work of diplomats and other tracks. So after the COVID, the, the tracks for uh, civic diplomacy, uh, cultural diplomacy should be reestablished as well. I think 
this year and a half was one of the lowest levels of intensity of communication uh, between Ukraine and US, and we should not uh, stay with this. Yes, thanks, Mr. Mikhailov, for your speech on this matter. So I wanted to know that, yes, yeah, so the idea and the question of having the US ambassador to Ukraine is either of in crucial importance. So, and given the Putin Biden summit, when the parties agreed to name amb ambassadors like in Moscow and in Washington, so the idea of having an ambassador of Washington in Kiev gives and attracts even more need in these such times here yeah, of uh, like a crisis of a global system and in the configuration of our relations between the West, the collective West, and between the US. Yeah, so now I will give the floor to Madam Anna. So I guess she will give us more of a point of security point of view, as Mr. Mahalo uh, apparently said about the security dimension. So, as I said, Madam Anna is a resident, Carnegie is one resident fellow of Russian Eurasia program. So, I guess so the speech will be related to the security dimension of relations in this triangle between Moscow, Washington, and Kiev. So, Madam Anna, please, you're welcome to speak. Please turn your microphone on. Uh, we can get here. Yeah, now it's game. No matter how many times I've done this, I still forget to uh, activate my uh, mic. I apologize. Um, Victor, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I have to admit, I'm, uh, I'm really eager to, I joined in, hoping to share my uh, research with uh, scholars and practitioners, policymakers who are working on this issue. And I uh, thank my co-panelists for insightful comments. I do have to note that uh, my approach to US-Ukraine issues is really from a bird's eye view and perhaps a bit, uh, a bit more academic than you would like on a Friday morning or an evening. Uh, but I, and actually if it wasn't for the COVID, I would be in Ukraine. I was hoping to visit Ukraine this summer uh, primarily to conduct field work and fill in some of this uh, granular detail that I need for this ongoing research. Um, so currently I am working on armed conflicts and peace processes in Eastern Europe, uh, as well as South Caucasus, the Middle East. Um, and in this presentation, I will be asking more questions actually than answering them. I'm a relative, uh, my approach to uh, Ukraine is largely comparative. It's my research questions that have been driving me to Ukraine. Um, in terms of um, so so uh, this uh, uh, the this comparative perspective, I've been fascinated, um, intrigued by the really regional roots of security provision, democratic consolidation, state building in post-Soviet period and in Russia's vicinities. To specify, I have been asking as to why some regions pacify after imperial retreat. Um, in this case, after the end of the Cold War, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, some regions pacified, others got caught in armed conflicts of very severity. Um, the Soviet collapse and the end of the Cold War obviously is just this such kind of a momentum. And um, raise this in my work, I do try to grapple with this question as to why the Baltics emerged as a peaceful region, while South Caucasus caught in flames. And uh, Ukraine has been, the conflicts in Ukraine have experienced a lag, uh, essentially after the end, of the, Cold, at the end of the Cold War and the Soviet collapse. I did publish an edited volume on Russia called, um, in 2018 with Georgetown University Press, uh, the title is Russia Abroad, uh, Driving Regional Fracture in Post-Communist Eurasia and Beyond. And Vsevolod Samokhalov actually applied the regional fracture theory to uh, Ukraine, how Russia is using regional fracture um, uh, to project in its vicinities from Donbass to Damascus in order to project power globally. Since this book, though, I started to expand the scope to see whether this is a contemporary phenomenon, number one. Number two, whether it is only Russia that is engaged in this. 
And my early findings do show that actually Europe and the West do in, engage their unintended consequences of their policies that do polarize these regions. And I will talk about US-Ukraine relations in that context. And of course, Turkey is also engaged in a very similar uh, strategy of regional fracture to project global influence. Uh, you see this in the Middle East, uh, uh, Turkish policy, Erdogan policies in the Middle East, Nagorno-Karabakh, Mediterranean. Um, now, uh, in terms of broad arguments on US-Ukraine relations, I, and this is kind of counterintuitive, perhaps I, I will sound counterintuitive to you, and uh, think of this as me being a devil's advocate. Let me just say up front, I strongly encourage US-Ukraine relations deepening of it, uh, elevating its strategic significance, but I fully share the analysis of my co-panelists and some of the themes that Scott in particular highlighted, that the Western attention is switching, is moving to uh, China, um, um, and uh, in this, the rise of multipolarity, the weakening of rules-based world order, to add to this that the United States itself domestically is, has been experiencing a democratic decline. So with all of these variables, I argue that it is important for countries such as Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, uh, to pay more attention to their immediate regional neighborhood. Uh, region building, I argue, is a key strategy of both dealing with neighbors that are quite illiberal, uh, but also on the U.S. side, U.S. does need to take region building much more seriously uh, because the research does show that democracies do consolidate regionally. Uh, Ukraine's uh, prospects of democratization are sensitive to uh, neighboring countries, the same way Armenia's and Georgia's democratization are codependent. So understanding this regional dimension in the way United States provides for foreign aid, for example, support civil society, cultivating grassroots connections, I would argue, is hugely important in parallel to US-Ukraine bilateral relations. Um, uh, it'd be hard to argue that debate that Washington, in Washington, within the Washington policy discourse, Ukraine is largely viewed through the Kremlin-centric lens as an extension to US-Russia relations. And this is also a replicating in the case of uh, South Caucasus. This Kremlin-centric approach to US policies in Ukraine is shared in other parts of the region. Uh, I advocate in my um, uh, approach, regionalizing US relations with post-Soviet countries. And this again entails in investing in immediate regional connectivity with, between these countries. So uh, more concretely, bilateral alliance-driven approach to Ukraine uh, in Eastern Europe that has been practiced by United States tended to geopoliticize Ukraine's domestic consolidation processes. Scott mentioned that Ukraine has to work hard in not letting United States to get, to, to get too much involved into its domestic politics. A few months ago, a few maybe a month ago, actually, you saw a, a Western Europe, United European Union, and United States involved in trying to mediate a dispute inside the conflict inside between political forces inside Georgia. Neighboring Armenia actually has been modeling through in its kind of do it yourself model of democratization. I'm in Armenia right now, and it's nerve wracking to watch. We have elections coming up on Sunday. Um, uh, so perhaps we could talk about that as well. But this, this, this putting, we have, I guess what I'm arguing that we have to be careful in putting too much stock in bilateral relations because uh, so far they have geopoliticized democratic transitions in post-Soviet regions, countries that are attempting to democratize. Heightened US-Russia relations then seep into Ukraine's domestic politics. They produce polarization and undermine prospects of long-term democratic consolidation. Um, and the growing scholarship on democratic transition has already demonstrated the geopoliticization of democratic breakthroughs weakens their grassroots support, 
portrays democratization as a Western import and discredits the very long pre-Soviet history uh, for of democratization and civic governance that existed in Ukraine within the Russian Empire. This is this actually the same in the in case of Armenia as well as Georgia uh, also. This bilateral and binary approach. Uh, again, contrast to this existing scholarship on regional roots of democratization and conflict management, growing body of research has convincingly documented the potency of regionalism for global security and economic development. We know now that democracy strengthened regionally, economies in developing countries are especially sensitive to those of their immediate regional neighbors. Conflicts in one country tend to proliferate regionally, Conflict management strategies work better with, uh, within regional forums. Um, and fractured regions, such as those in Russia's vicinities, erode state governments, uh, governance and derail democratization. I apologize. I'm just going to have to turn this phone off. Just one sec. So online uh, forum has its Backsides, but the, <laughs> um, the next point uh, in regards, and actually, this approach has not served U.S.'s strategic interests well either. Um, this, the net effect of this geopoliticized and selective democracy promotion in Russia's southern peripheries, south eastern peripheries, um, Eastern Europe and South Caucasus, to be precise. Uh, also work did not help United States to be effective in projecting its interest in these regions. Um, these policies with Georgia and Ukraine, for example, uh, that the way they evolved that appear in Moscow's eyes as countervailing offensive alliances against Russia. And they look like Cold War era alliance politics cultivated by the US with select intermediary politically favored state in specific regions. NATO expansion in Eastern Europe and the Baltics, partnership for peace agreements, uh, all of this program tend to, in the context of fragile democratization, tend to um, create tensions, add to the tensions, uh, kind of build into this narrative of, of Kremlin-centric uh, approach uh, and that create polarization and the drag Ukraine in the process. Um, they do give an offensive texture um, to the relationship uh, between um, US and Russia, and it just makes things much harder towards domestic democratization down the road. Um, in, in terms of, let me skip on a few things, uh, and perhaps I can return to them later on. Top down and bilateral versus top down and bilateral policies versus bottom up and regional uh, is the is essentially the approach that I advocate. Um, current U.S. policies confront nations such as Georgia as well as Ukraine with a perilous moral hazard. The primacy of Tbilisi's or Kiev's dependency on faraway Washington or Brussels effectively de-incentivizes any diplomatic search from a regionally rooted sustainable security and economic orders. Uh, NATO membership becomes indispensable because there is no alternative. EU membership comes to represent uh, an economic an inevitable and the only solution. And these processes in the long term pull these regions apart leaving reform efforts ruthless, less resilient, and vulnerable to the moods in Brussels and Washington and elsewhere. Uh, this binary approach to the Kremlin and selective security and political support to Ukraine and Georgia works to nourish democratic breakthroughs in both countries, but it has proven less effective in building state capacities to lock in democratic gains in the states in the long term. Heightened polarization coming from this geopoliticized democratic transition enables overt and covert Russian interference in both states. And in this context of weak political parties to manage this polarization through institutional channels, the persistent state weakness uh, remains as a result. Um, in terms of conflict management, and I conclude again, I apologize if this was more academic on a Friday evening or a Friday morning, depending where you are, um, the blinders from bilateralism in conflict regions. Kremlin-centric view of the conflicts in Donbass 
as well as the conflicts in South Caucasus are also problematic. In 2015, I did uh, publish a book, monograph called The Network Regionalism as Conflict Management with Stanford University Press. And here I've covered the efficacy of regionally wired peace processes. Here in the, uh, uh, that it does apply in the context of the Donbass conflict. Uh, this Kremlin-centric approach you're looking, viewing the, uh, the Donbass conflict simply through the Kremlin's eyes within this polarized networks underscores and obscures the complexity of this particular case as an armed conflict. Obviously, it's very different, much different than the conflicts in the South Caucasus, because this is a case where it started the war uh, produced the conflict as opposed to conflict producing a war. Uh, but still, the complexity of the conflict is obscured by focusing on looking at it through this Kremlin-centric approaches. Um, let me conclude um, simply by saying that uh, what is, has been characteristic in um, the uh, in particular, both in this uh, in the conflict in Donbas as well as in Nagorno-Karabakh, and in, in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh war, we actually see the problems with this approach, meaning looking for this top-down search of solutions, this grand bargain, this futile search of grand bargain, a geopolitical deal with Russia, hoping that it will trickle down, and instead not paying enough attention to building peace building processes from bottom up. Um, these processes in both cases stand out with their top heavy and elite driven compositions dominated by small number of negotiators from conflict sides, highly unrepresentative and detached from respective societies. Uh, but actually some of my field work online, actually Zoom field work uh, with Ukraine um, uh, peace building specialists does demonstrate that actually there is a lot more democratization drive in Donbass conflicts from Ukraine side than we have seen in Nagorno-Karabakh. Let me just simply conclude with this sentence that um, it was heartbreaking for me to watch the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, the very savage war, and then read commentaries on Ukraine, some analysts actually from uh, the West, uh, arguing that, looking at this militarization, this militarized approach to this conflict, and saying that this is exactly what Ukraine should be doing. Militarization has its costs in terms of state weakness that it produces, in terms of derailed democratization that it results, further polarization. So I do hope, and this is something I'll be working on, comparing the two peace processes that um, a militarized solution will not be the takeaway from the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And I will stop here. I apologize if I went on for too long. So it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Manana, for your point of view on this matter. So I wanted to make two little remarks to with our discussion. So, like, uh, as you said about the regional fragmentation, is true. So, like, in Ukraine, we had so it's east west uh, division split, very evident, as Mr. Mikhailo also said about this, like, anti Western narratives, they are most dominant in the east and the like, southeast of Ukraine. We have a new narrative for, like, related with Soros and related with France called Sorosata. So, it's like a uh, uh, so it's the same used uh, like to pro Western, like guys of a Western point part of our society, as labels like due to the name of George Soros and this like regional fragmentation, we also have evidence in Ukraine. I also want to add, so as you, as you said about the Grand Bargain, so the idea, Russian led idea of having some kind of a contract with uh, the West, with the collective West or with the US. So we make a deal and uh, split the world into two parts as like Portugal and Spain do in 15th century. I am glad that this doesn't work right now. Yeah, so the Scott actually wanted to add and to comment your fine point of view and I will give him an opportunity in a sec, but not to forget, so as I saw two times some of the the audience following us was raising their hands on. So please, you may write on the chat on Zoom because I can't like interrupt the speaker. You may chat on Zoom your question or you may chat on our Facebook page, uh, whatever you want in the commentaries or directly to our page in Facebook. Yeah, and afterwards, if we have time, we will ask the question. So now, please, Scott, uh, you are free to say. Yeah. 
Thank you, thank you. I, I, just briefly to, to react to, to Anna, I, I agreed with so much of, of, of what you said, um, and you made many, many very intelligent points, um, and especially this point about um, viewing Ukraine or the conflict through the lens uh, of the Kremlin, or what I sometimes call the, the East-West dynamic, and it, it, it causes trouble for Americans uh, in Ukraine, looking at Ukraine or Georgia, in so, so many places, um, we, we, we default to seeing um, parts of, 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 of the Caucasus or Eastern Europe only through, um, through that lens. And, and, and I think this is unfortunately something where the Ukrainian government has not helped itself. And I think about the stories that uh, the Ukrainian government shares in Washington, what they present, um, you know, and they focus on uh, NATO, Nord Stream 2, um, access to Western weapons. And these are all stories that um, uh, are about the Kremlin, that are about Russia, and, and many of them are, are, are issues or areas where progress can only be made um, with some level of of, of cooperation or buy-in from, um, from the Kremlin. And, and, and hence, you know, the effect is one that Americans only see Ukraine in the context of, of, of the Kremlin. And, and two, uh, progress can only be made with the involvement of, of the Kremlin. Um, and that none of these stories or narratives are ones in which Ukraine is fully able to resolve or make progress on, um, on its own. And in some ways, even, um, inadvertently remove agency um, from Ukraine. And, and so I, I hopefully, if someone, whoever is watching out there on the internet, uh, I, I think in Washington, the Ukrainian government has missed a big opportunity um, to talk about um, uh, cultural issues and to do cultural diplomacy and, and, and to have a broader conversation um, with, with Washington, DC and the broader American public to a certain extent um, about about Ukraine and about um, what Ukraine can offer and about all, all the beautiful myriad aspects of, of Ukrainian culture and civil society has done so much to pick up the slack in this area. But I, I think for, for my mind, this is one of the uh, most important things that the Ukrainian government could invest in um, and not just leave this space to civil society or, 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 or to oligarchic money, um, but to put money into telling a positive story about Ukraine that doesn't involve the Kremlin. It's not about Putin. Um, Ukraine has so much to offer on its own and can make progress um, in so many areas um, on, on its own. Um, but the, unfortunately, that story just is not the one that Ukrainian leaders have chosen um, to make. And I'm curious, you know, with, with upcoming meeting with um, President Zelensky and President Biden, um, I hope that's an opportunity to not just talk about Putin or the Kremlin. Um, it's, a, it's a chance to highlight and hold up the wonderful example of Ukraine. Um, but I hope, I hope, I hope they do that. So thank yeah. you. No one thought. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Scott, a lot for your comment. I guess it's a bridge to the second part of our discussion about what to do to achieve something, yeah, to, to change the rhetorics in relation between U.S. and Ukraine. What parties should do? to like start in the relations. Yeah, so it's the second question I would like to ask our panelists. So as Scott said, uh, we doesn't need, don't need to act on as like barrier limitros. So as a country just protecting from Russia. So it's not enough to be a competitive play in the like, global wealth and uh, polarized region. So yes, man, man has said, so the region is becoming like a uh, old cold war rhetoric. So you are pro or you are against Russia. Yes, yeah, so in that, in that kind of region, it's being a limit of state, protecting of like new Bolsheviks is not enough in order to gain support from, from Washington. Yeah, so we'll start our second uh, round. So I, and I will reverse somehow the order. So Mr. Mahalo will start and then we will have Pato, Madam Anna, so please, yeah. Well, in my opinion, the, the major issue with uh, our Ukrainian American dialogue is to see strategically what is Ukraine's uh, model of development. 
So if we know what's our need in the future and where we can go and cooperate, then this dialogue would have a, a real meaning. Right now, from our discussion, I see that uh, in addition to Moscow-centric uh, issue, the, the model between well, relations between Kyiv and uh, DC, there's also Beijing appearing. So it creates additional uh, pro provocateur in terms of uh, paying attention to them, then to Moscow, and then to Kyiv. So if it's the case, uh, for us, it's going to be even more difficult to promote our own agenda. But this agenda still should be made. Are we staying this buffering zone between the West and Russia? Are we becoming the battering uh, rim against Russia? Or is there the, the third option? Is there, is there something that uh, Ukrainian well, elites and the people actually would come up to some decision. So this national long-standing need or interest should be created in order to have a sensible um, dialogue with uh, our American partners. And America itself is reconstructing. It returns to the West. There's this Westlessness situation in which probably this Westlessness will decrease somewhat and how Ukraine fits in. And I agree with uh, Anna saying that this geopolitization of development and democratization was very harmful for, for finding local legitimacy, regional legitimacy to our democratic processes. But again, it's also connected with the issue of agency. In many ways, and uh, we had several publications in our ideology and politics journal, uh, the, the, we can witness actually that Georgia or Azerbaijan being squeezed between Russia and Turkey still managed to have their own way of keeping the agency or even developing it. While Ukraine, uh, due to many uh, different issues, uh, has lost it. So I think Ukraine-Ukrainian dialogue would become very much important to start up sensible uh, dialogue, multi-track dialogue with the United States and Western Europe. Right now, Brussels, DC, Berlin, Paris, they, they, they want to hear the, the positive agenda, but this positive agenda can come up from us. Yes, thanks Mr. Mahalo for your point of view. So our discussion, uh, tells us how the lines of U.S.-Ukraine relations correlate with the lines of U.S.-Moscow-Beijing dialogue, dialogue triangle, or some other tendencies taking place in Eastern Europe. That's why it's impossible to see our relations between the White House and between the Bankola only on the some isolated from the whole world point of view. So as to, to say some like example, so we had a motor siege case. So it's uh, like a fabric in the Eastern Ukraine. And we had the like, interest of China, US and Russia it was like pro Russian voices. I uh, was saying, so Ukraine can make something uh, independently from the West, it's dependent on the West and so on. And we were trapped. So in that kind of new triangle, yeah. So the need to understand what we really want uh, are of crucial importance these days. Yeah, so Ado, please, we uh, want to hear from you. What do you think about this? So what do you think about this line of US-Ukraine relations? So what should we do? And maybe US should do something as well, but uh, how do you see the situation? Yeah. Oh my God, there were so many insightful comments already said, uh, and I agree with so many things that are said uh, on that discussion. Uh, first of all, I'd like to focus uh, and reference to the paper that we've prepared to kind of focus on the different levels of the cooperation between the US and Ukraine to kind of understand the ways of how they should or would interact in many, many levels. So 
At first, I would like to uh, go with the level of public diplomacy, which was really mentioned at that period of time. And Mr. Scott scratched the surface of that issue at some point of time, because really, I agree with him that Ukrainian government really missed the opportunity to represent Ukraine as a modern and well integrated part of a global society because the Ukrainian government somehow approaches the international image of Ukraine at some points uh, too many too much having on a tradition on something what's been in the past but the point is that the ukraine has so much to offer in terms of the modern things of modern uh, society modern culture uh and etc and i think that uh the ukrainian governmental uh institutions really have to understand how to promote this in the United States, because maybe it seems that it takes too much effort or too much money, or it's to, or maybe that this market of culture, you know, is too competitive, maybe for some people. But the point is that there are opportunities and methods and uh, tools to achieve these goals. Uh, almost effortlessly and without taking uh, many financial resources, if we talk like that. And the uh, digital systems really help in that because internet is an open space and everybody has to understand that we are living the times when a person from Michigan or Virginia or California or from whatever can see what Ukraine has to offer in a global context and in a global landscape. And we have to use it. And of course, there's some progress to that, thanks to the new concept of the public diplomacy from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and from the like uh, transformation of the Ukrainian Institute. But we have to uh, give much more effort in that context. For example, for example, it's also the needed move from the United States, especially in the context, in the current context of that message of the external governments that's been heavily promoted by the pro-Russian political parties in Ukraine. And of course it's a mess and it's absurd but the United States have to put some effort to destroy, to bust these myths. And we are talking about the informational campaign. We're talking about uh, the cooperation between the cultural institutions, between the NGOs, between the research institutions. Uh, and actually this panel discussion embodies that level of cooperation. But the point is, that as a person who uh, on, on the personal experience uh, actually had the opportunity to go to the United States and to learn something about the US foreign policy from the first hands and uh, to have that kind of uh, experience that is essential uh, in breaking this myths about the American government, uh, to break this uh, post-Soviet stereotypes that are still living in the Ukrainian society, unfortunately, because of some media outlets and because of, again, some pro-Russian activists and politicians. And I think that the educational diplomacy, if we can call it like that, can bring so much to it. And the Ukrainian youth really deserves to enjoy these kinds of things because they constantly prove, like we constantly prove ourselves as a very smart, very hardworking people who are not afraid of different challenges. 
And I think that the United States really has to see it. And that's why in the paper, for example, we offer to establish some new uh, exchange programs for the Ukrainian young professionals and et cetera, because it can really make the difference. It can bring the visible impact and visible results. And if we're talking about the, the other levels of the cooperation between these two states, we also have to understand that all these steps have to have the visible results because the populism actually is born out of the prevalence of such initiatives that are only working on the paper, but it's really important to make it work in, in real life. And uh, I think that that's one of the most challenging tasks in all of that, but it is maybe the most rewarding task, because if we manage to accomplish that, we can get so many good things and the real improvement to make people like the average people from the small towns, from villages, think that the United States is not something harmful and is not something bad because it really is not. And I think that we can take so many steps and so many different uh, levels and branches of cooperation, but all of them can easily fail, unfortunately, because of that skepticism from some social groups in Ukraine. And we can multiply the chances for the success of such initiatives when we will break or destroy that skepticism by the real examples, by the real ideas, real initiatives, and real work and projects. And I think that it's crucially important for these relations. And to conclude my commentary on that, I would say that the mutual understanding um, of the interests of both parties in these relations and the understanding of importance to destroy that skepticism and that battle against informational influence from Russia and also the modernity, the creativity, the readiness to accept new approaches and new formats, the adaptability to the new conditions, to the new world, because we are basically living in the new world right now because of the global pandemic. All of that can help not only in the bilateral relations between Ukraine and the United States, but it can improve the Ukrainian foreign policy in general and its relations with other important actors on the international arena. And all of that can give us a uh, much more support from the world in the situations when it's needed. Yeah, thanks, Nato, for your point of view. So, yeah, informational security, informational space. So, the, our perception of the world is even more important than the world itself, because our lens is in the case of Ukraine, US. Or, uh, relations, the lenses of Ukrainians, like having a point of view of US or something like devilish or something trustworthy also is of uh, like significant importance when it comes to decoding our relations. Yeah, so we have 10 minutes left. I would have like the same question. I will address it to the man and Mr. Scott. So I would like you to give a short commentary on this. So like uh, both generally or specifically in a particular field, yeah, you may choose if you want 
what they should be done because the issue is complex yeah and we can decode the relations and say so oh, hello you should do this 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 and this in all domain and that will work yeah so we suppose we propose ideas and then we see what happens next. Yes, so, Madam Anna, what do you think should the parties do to enhance this level of confidence, maybe in the security dimension? Yes, so the question is, what should be done? And we would really appreciate it if we could make it like, uh, so not uh, like in a timely manner to say it like this, yeah. Sure, and um, I, I I think it's important to recognize that uh, several of the countries in Russia's sort of uh, western, southern peripheries, Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, uh, Moldova, are the Balkans to a certain extent, are going through uh, democratization in a very heightened, again, with heightened security environment in the backdrop. Uh, security issues aren't conflict, unresolved conflict on its own. We tend to view those separate from internal democratization processes, but they're hugely intertwined. So understanding how to manage democratization in such settings and how, uh, what type of approaches to develop in negotiation processes in the context of the conflict is critical. So to simplify this, I guess in more concrete terms, Ukraine um, needs, similar actually to Georgia as well, um, needs to know what to ask from Washington. And I would argue that if um, Ukraine had certain level of geopolitical stability, uh, and I realize I'm asking for a lot, <laughs> uh, realizing that there are no set security orders in that region. The line of European Union cuts through one way. Uh, Ukraine is not aligned in a particular block, and then you have Russia. But still, some level of certainty, geopolitical certainty, would give would then give um, Ukraine time to nourish its democratization bottom up. Um, and uh, the, for example, having relying on the United States or Europeans for judicial reform, one of the hardest ones. And I looked at this for uh, Ukraine in particular. It's difficult. Uh, for Ukraine, it has been challenging with a lot of Western support. Uh, Georgia, it has been challenging. For Armenia, it has been very, very difficult. So regardless whether post-Soviet states are democratizing on their own or with Western support, judicial transitions have not been happening. And that really connects with the whole corruption issue. So I guess I would, uh, 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 again, uh, argue that um, providing some sort of a geopolitical stability and thinking about the approaches of the conflict in Donbass in particular uh, needs to be viewed in this context, Democrat democratization, democratic consolidation, and the uh, unresolved conflicts need to be viewed uh, with one another. And I wanted to actually, I really like what Mikhail said in regards to developing agency. Um, I would push that even further. And I would say that whether it's Ukraine, Georgia, uh, in particular, Armenia, uh, the, this country, um, uh, Moldova, these countries need to take ownership of their region. Looking, I spent uh, my last year on sabbatical, looking at historical, uh, a little bit of did a deep dive into historical analysis of pre-Soviet imperial histories of Ukraine, um, uh, Russian Empire, the South Caucasus, the Baltics. It's fascinating. And as, as well as comparing it to other parts of the world, Latin America, um, so much depends, so much of state building and democratic progress, economic development does depend on ability So, Manamana, uh, I, I guess we're having some internet connection problems, so like it happens. We are hosting an online discussion with, oh, Maria, you're with us. Yeah, so please, yeah, continue. 
So in regards to Belarus, right? Pushing too hard from the West on Belarus would not work for the same region, the reasons that it would taint the movement. But at the same time, building region-wide network and democracy promotion are critical. Armenia's upcoming elections, um, I'm at the edge of my seat, uh, hoping that the elections go smoothly, but uh, there are, as in many parts of the world, you do have uh, successor authoritarian states that are now participating, uh, uh, successor, I'm sorry, authoritarian uh, successor parties, political parties participating in the elections now. Studies show that in about throughout the 20th century, majority in, of Democrat cases, the successor authoritarian successor parties participate in democratic elections, but they get socialized into the new rules of the game. In the case of Armenia, we'll see, not so clear, um, uh, but imagine if Armenia did have much deeper connectivity with Georgian civil society organizations. Um, United States, I think the era of US, the Western support of democracy promotion, I think that period is, uh, is declining uh, for better or for worse. So there is a lot more need for grassroots support for democratization as well as security provision. Um, I, I will stop here, actually. Um, yeah, I will stop here. I hope that answers your question, Victor. Yeah, thanks, Madame. So yeah, before I move to Scott to make the final speech of our discussion, I want to say, like, so this is we are talking about the pre-imperial uh, like, period. I want to give a quote of like Mikhail Rushevsky. So Mikhail Rushevsky was one of the leader of Ukraine national movement, uh, like after the collapse of the Russian Empire. And he has the book, so who are Ukrainians and what do they want? And we haven't still figured a clear answer to the question, what does Ukraine want? And I guess it also like is one of the milestones to depend on our foreign policy interests and relations towards US. Yeah, so now please, our final quote of the discussion will be delegated to Scott. So the final word answering my questions and we'll have them, so please. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, very briefly, I, I, I do love the idea of regionalism. And there's a, a lot there. Um, I think from, from an American perspective, uh, some, of, some of the past efforts um, seem to have been nice announcements followed up by not much. Um, and so in the way of <clears throat> hopefully avoiding more of that, um, I think Black Sea security might be um, a, a place that really makes sense for that sort of regional cooperation. And I, I, you know, I think uh, Ukrainian and, and Romanian leadership um, together with, with, with Georgia, perhaps Bulgaria as supporting members could really um, uh, do a lot for Black Sea security. And that would be seen in Washington as, um, as Ukraine um, not being a security consumer but a security provider, given the great difficulty of the U.S. Navy accessing the Black Sea, especially in, in a crisis scenario. Um, so I think smart regionalism like that could really be uh, a very attractive uh, for an American audience. Um, and getting to also to Anna's point about, about um, providing this geopolitical security for Ukraine to allow space for, for democracy and, and to reform to be better fostered. Um, I, I think in that regard, um, I think about the Zelensky visit coming up hopefully later this summer to Washington. Um, and I, I, I hope my colleagues and friends and everyone in Kyiv understands that that's the beginning of a process. And President Zelensky coming to Washington is about Zelensky. And it, it, it's about him bringing something back to his political base in Ukraine. It will not do very much really anything at all to change um, American perceptions. Uh, I think what will change American perceptions and what will provide that geopolitical space, that, that stability space, is we need to get Americans into Ukraine. President Biden needs to go to Kyiv. Um, Vice President Harris needs to go to Kyiv. American business needs to be in Kyiv. Um, Ukraine doesn't need American troops in the East Ukraine needs American factories. And that, that sort of, of geopolitical interest in a way that matters and will provide space in a helpful way to the reform effort really goes through, um, through I think, commerce 
and investment, um, not through the defense sector. And so my, my, my final comment is, I think we need to get in every sense of the word, in every sense of, of the phrase, get Americans um, into Ukraine. We probably don't need more delegations of, of Ukrainian MPs and, and and, and oligarchs and whoever else comes to DC on a seemingly weekly basis, we don't need more of that. We, we need, we need a, a, you know, a reverse flow and getting um, uh, American attention and American money um, going into Ukraine in, in, in not just in weapons, but in, in every other way. Um, and I think that will probably do the most and will help encourage um, reform. Because of course, Ukraine, to attract that kind of investment has to be a rule of law state. It has to have a judiciary. It has to have all those things that, that, that enable that investment to occur. Um, and so I think if we can think about things through that framework, that might be a very healthy way um, and a very effective way for President Zelensky to think about um, a kind of a, a revamp of US-Ukrainian relations and how to take advantage of this moment Ukraine has with a president and an administration that's probably more pro-Ukrainian and more informed about what's happening in Ukraine than at any time since independence. Um, so again, you know, this is a moment for Ukraine. I hope we don't miss it. Yeah, thanks. The window might be closing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks, Scott. So US, uh, Ukraine relations are not about summits. They're not about like big words, uh, you know, or handshakes, they're more of an everyday walk and the cooperation on many levels. Yeah, so Manuel, I wanted to, to add something or what I interrupted you. No, 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 I was simply attempting a joke for love to Scott saying that it actually indeed, I fully agree that Biden is perhaps one of those rare pres presidents that knows Ukraine really well. Um, but at the same time, I think we should not take it for granted that, that United States already found its way out of a very threatening attack on its democratic institutions and I, I don't think United States is out of the woods yet. So uh, we, we should really uh, continue to our work in the United States as well uh, to keep United States on the right side of the history. Yeah, so uh, I hope so the multilateralism is bad because Ukraine is like multilateralism in joy what it's named also to be a provider at some point. Hope it will come to. Yeah, so thanks a lot, all of you, for the participation. Thanks a lot, our for viewers on Zoom and followers on Facebook for viewing us today. I will remind all the audience that about our invited speakers. So, invited speakers are Dr. Anna Oanyang, non resident senior fellow of the Kanegi Endowment for International Peace, Dr. Mihailo Minakov, senior advisor on Ukraine and Second Institute. Scott Cullinane, head of US Europe Alliance, and Akur Kaldamasa, senior fellow of Sintian Cadastra. So please write, uh, read the analytical paper prepared by art on our website. You may also read the Canon uh, Institute blog on Ukraine, Focus Ukraine. You may also read some <laughs> materials on Ukraine of Carnegie and materials on Ukraine and on US Europe uh, relations on US. Europe Alliance. Yes. Yeah. So I guess it's it. Thanks a lot of you once again. I will end the public transmission in a while and the recording will be available on YouTube afterwards. So thanks a lot once again for your time. It was a pleasure to have you at our discussion today. Thank you and have a good day. Okay. Bye bye. It was Thank a you pleasure. so much for coming. Yeah. Bye. Bye then.